Alrighty, everyone. So we're going to go ahead and continue on with our last lecture on the antiquity period in the Middle East. Uh, so specifically this topic of what happens when the Roman civilization enters the Middle East. Now, uh, when you think of ancient Rome, obviously you think of Italy and Greece and the Mediterranean Sea, but the ancient Roman civilization did in fact stretch all the way into Judea. So let's start with a map. And here on this map, we can kind of get a sense of what's going to happen in terms of where the Roman civilization is going to reach into. And what you can see here is that they eventually start to move into the Middle East, specifically Judea, of course, around the year 60 BC. So this is the region we're really focused on, just this area there, basically is modern day Israel, Syria, Egypt, of course. And so you don't need to know a lot of Roman history, obviously. If you take History 110, we spend a lot of time on Rome. That's a fun class and a, a good time to, to talk about ancient Rome. Uh, but what you do need to know is that as Roman civilization expanded, you know, and began to grow, it eventually enters this what we call the Republic phase of the Roman civilization. And during the Roman Republic, they had senators and they had all these other political positions and it was a very dynamic system. And Rome grew and they expanded and eventually entered Egypt. And, you know, if you know the story of Julius Caesar um, and Cleopatra and all of that, if you don't know that story, that's okay. You don't need to know it for this class. But it was around that time period, around 60 BC, that Rome moves into this region. Now, also shortly after 60 BC, the Roman Republic falls and the Roman world becomes an empire. And when the Roman world becomes an empire, that's where the issues really begin to develop that are going to impact the Romans in Judea and especially the Jewish and even the Christian populations in that area that will eventually emerge, right? In 60 BC, there's obviously no Christians yet, uh, but it all it does connect. All right, so how, what, what exactly happens when the Romans move into Judea that helps bring about, you know, a conflict? So let's kind of talk about what we're going to look at here. So here we have kind of the root causes, right? And I'd say there's, you know, the root causes and three conflicts that are all going to be associated with the Roman Empire moving into the region. So the first thing you need to understand is the Roman Empire develops in the year 27 BC. As always, you don't need to memorize the dates, uh, but it is important to know that it's an empire. Why? Because when you have an empire, you have an emperor. And the difference between a republic and an emperor is pretty obvious. In a republic, you have a lot of political positions. In an emperor, you have one guy, an emperor, who controls everything. And you go, why would this create an issue for the Romans when they move into Judea when it's an emperor versus a republic? Well, it ties in with, of course, the Jewish faith being a monotheistic faith. And this monotheism issue is what's at the core of the conflict between the Romans and the Jewish people living in Judea, right? Remember, the Jewish people are living there after the Babylon captivity. Cyrus lets them back. The Jewish people are there, right, as we just talked about. The problem is, in Roman civilization, if you're an empire, you believe that the top authority should be the emperor. If you follow a monotheistic religion, by definition, your top authority is not going to be an emperor. Your top authority is going to be God. And so for the Roman emperors, as the Roman Empire begins, the first Roman emperor was a man named Augustus. If you don't remember his name, that's okay. Um, you know, and when this first Roman emperor Augustus comes into power, you know, and all the following Roman emperors that are going to exist for hundreds of years, they want to be the guy. In fact, some of these Roman emperors were deified when they died. Um, and so they, they're in many ways seen as gods. And so how can you be loyal to Rome? and still be loyal to, you know, your Jewish faith. And the Roman, and then later on with the Christian faith, it's going to be the same issue until eventually Rome becomes Christian themselves. But that's a different story for another class. So this is the core of the problem. It's for the Romans, they see the Jewish people living in Judea as essentially committing treason because they, they, are, they, they follow this monotheistic religion. So I hope that's clear. That's kind of the root of where you have a lot of the conflicts. And later on, you're going to have the same issue with Christianity until eventually Rome becomes a Christian civilization. 
All right, so I hope that's clear. That's the root of the conflict. Now, there are three major conflicts that are going to take place. Uh, one during the emperor named Vespasian and his son Titus. Uh, so we'll talk about that story. We'll talk about the story of Masada as well, which also takes place during uh, the time of Vespasian and Titus. And then we'll talk about a Roman emperor named Hadrian. So we're going to kind of look at these three events and talk about, you know, what happens during these three stories that are very important uh, to the land of Judea. And remember, I talked about one of the themes, what happens as other civilizations, well, how do other civiliz civilizations impact the Jewish people? Well, you're going to see, especially when we get to the last one here, it's an impact that lasts for centuries. Uh, so we're going to talk about that right now. All right, so the first kind of major conflict, I, can, I think it's safe to say, happens in the year 70 AD. So by now, the Romans have already been in Judea for about 100 years. The Roman emperors were not happy with the Jewish population there. And during the reign of Vespasian, one of these very important Roman emperors, he had a son named Titus, who later will become emperor as well. And it was during this period of Vespasian and Titus that Titus, his son, goes into Judea. He goes into Judea, and what does he do? He destroys the second temple. So if you remember uh, when we did the lecture on Jewish culture and Jewish holidays, you might see this term again, uh, Tisha B'Av, right? If you remember that, the, seven, the, the, the ninth day of the month of Av. And it was on that day in 70 AD that the Romans destroyed Solomon's temple, the second temple that they were rebuilt after the Babylon captivity. Now, this image you're seeing here is kind of interesting because this image you're seeing here is actually what's called the Arch of Titus. And if you ever go to Rome and you go to the Forum in Rome, which is just a stone throw away from uh, the Colosseum, you see the Arch. It's the entrance into the Roman Forum. Now, inside the arch, if you look at it closely, you might be able to recognize what you're looking at here. And this looks like a menorah, um, a, or can, uh, a menorah, right? If you're not familiar with that, of course, from the Jewish uh, traditions and holidays. And what you're seeing here is the spoils of the conquest of Judea. That when Titus goes in, he conquers this area, and as he conquered, the area is already under Jewish control, but he sacked Jerusalem, destroys Solomon's temple, the second temple, and then takes all this stuff away uh, to, to Rome, which was then later used to finance a lot of the building of the Colosseum. Um, and so this Arch of Titus is still there to this day. Um, and of course, the Colosseum is still there to this day. Uh, when Jewish people go to uh, Rome, tradition is if you're Jewish, you don't walk under the Arch of Titus because of the, the negative connotations it has with Jewish community. Uh, just as a little tangent, but one of my own little personal pet peeves, um, you know, these things are still standing today. And if you think of the Colosseum as well, that it's later used to, to murder Christians by, by thousands on top of thousands and what the Arch of Titus represents, Nobody ever talks about tearing these things down, and they shouldn't. Um, and I'm pointing this out because I, I, whenever I can in any course, I make this point because it's one of my personal, it's a little bit of a tangent, but I think it's an important one, especially if you teach history, is that there's, of course, a lot of people in the United States who say, hey, we should take down monuments of various people in our history because of the things they did. Guys, by that logic, there would be nothing standing up in the world. You don't tear these things down. You leave them, you talk about it, you tell the story. Um, and so when somebody walks to the Arch of Titus and they see this, they know what it is. You don't tear it down because it might make somebody upset. You teach the history of it. Uh, so, and it's also endless. If you use that logic, there'd be nothing left standing. You couldn't have anything to FDR because of the Japanese internment camps. You couldn't have things to, you know, almost any president of the United States up to any point. It's just it's like it's an endless list. You know, it's not just the Washington, Jeffersons, Lincolns, uh, Confederates. It's, a, it's anything. You don't tear the stuff down, you teach it. So anyways, anytime I see these historical monuments that relate to that, it always kind of jumps at me. All right, so you can just kind of take that for, for what would you'd like. All right, we move on. The next conflict is actually pretty dramatic. It's the story of Masada. Now, this is a great place. I've actually been there. I've climbed up this thing. Uh, so this is a lot of fun uh, in terms of historical, not a lot of fun for what happened there. Uh, so what's the story of Masada? So Masada, is, it, it's a fortress 
that was a Roman fortress that the Jewish people took over. A man named Eliezer Ben Yair, you see the name there, you definitely want to know his name, had a group of supporters known as the Zealots. Um, if you think of the word today, somebody who's a zealot, uh, what does that mean? Somebody who's a zealot, it means they're really into something, they, they're very passionate about something. Well, why is that? Because these zealots that followed Eliezer Ben Yair were Jewish people who had enough of the Roman uh, kind of conquest. They said, no, we're going to take this fortress, we're going to hold on this fortress, and we're not going to bend our knees to the Romans. It's just not going to happen. And so the Jewish people, led by Eliezer ben Yair, take this fortress, which is way up high in the middle of the, uh, actually, it's way up high near the lowest point in the Earth's surface. It's actually right next to the Dead Sea. And so the story goes, and Josephus here, the man Josephus here is actually the historian that we have all this information from. So he's the historian. So Eliezer ben Yair, he's the, the Jewish leader. The zealots are his followers, and they take control of this fort. There weren't that many of them. Uh, there were literally just hundreds of them. I believe there were about 960 of them. I was just checking my number there. And the Romans say, well, you're not going to hold on to this fort. And the Romans send 15,000 men. And these 15,000 men get to Masada, and they're like, well, we're going to take this fort from you. And the problem for the Romans is they have to go up this high cliff. So you can see where this is. I'm going to show you a couple more pictures in a second after I finish explaining the story. But the Romans eventually start to make their way up. There's 15,000 of them. They start to wear down the Jewish zealots. And as the Romans get very close to the top, Eliezer ben Yair, according to the few survivors we have of what happens here next, gives a speech. I want to read this to you so you know what Eliezer ben Yair tells his fellow zealots uh, as the Romans are about to enter their, their fortress now. This is what he says. Since we long ago resolved never to be servants to the Romans, nor to any other than God himself, who, who alone is the true and just Lord of mankind, the time has now come that obliges us to make that resolution true in practice. We were the very first that revolted against Rome, and we are the last that fight against them. And I cannot but esteem it as a favor of God that, that God has granted us that it is still our power to die bravely in a state of freedom. Let our wives die before they are abused, and our children before they have tasted slavery. And after they have slain them, let us bestow that glorious benefit upon one another mutually. So if you listen to that carefully, what do they do? They all kill themselves, and they kill themselves because they knew if the Romans had come up there, they would have slaved them tortured them and done all those horrible things. And so the zealots fight to the very end and end up committing suicide. Um, and it was interesting, I saw a documentary a few years back on this and uh, they were discussing, did this actually happen or not? And archeologists have gone into dig digs there uh, because, and they say, well, we don't find any bones. There's maybe if there are all these people dead, wouldn't we have found bones? And the answer also is, well, the Romans usually crucified, I'm sorry, um, I didn't just, sorry, not crucified, but um, um, this is my word, a cremated, sorry, cremated people. And so more than likely everything was burned, including the people. So there are some definitely primary sources of this story of Masada. So it's just another example of the Jewish people trying so hard to prevent their land now that the Romans have moved into for, from being taken away from them, that they were willing to, to get the point of the suicide. Of all of them. So that's the story of Masada. So Elias of Benir, the zealots, fight against the Roman. And again, this is also during the time of the Roman Emperor Vespasian. Here's just another really amazing image of Masada. Uh, and again, I, I have been there. It's pretty cool. And it's actually right near the Dead Sea as well. Uh, here's another image, one more image. And over here, over here, you could see actually parts of the Dead Sea. So, I mean, if you've never had a chance to go to Israel, I mean, this is the history of the Middle East class. Uh, so obviously this is one of the most amazing places on the earth to go and visit. There's so much history there, um, but this is a great photo. And you can climb up Masada in the morning and then go float in the Dead Sea. And if you've never been uh, there or never one day want to go there, it is quite an experience. Uh, here's the Dead Sea. This is minus 416 meters, not feet. It is the lowest place on the earth. This, these are all pictures I took when I was there. Um, and you actually go into the sea and you float there. You can uh, just go in there. There's so much salt. 
uh, that you just float in the Dead Sea. And here, what you see is the soil that I took a close-up picture. This is actually all salt still there. So all of this area here, it's all salt. Um, and in fact, if you put your go in there and you put your hands underneath and you can pick up cubes of salt, and that's actually really, really cool. If you get lucky, you can find a literally perfect cube um, you know, it, of salt. It's, it's a really rare thing. And so uh, if you ever go there, it's a really amazing thing to do. It's not, nothing to do with a history story, but it's one of the most remarkable places I've seen. Uh, there are a lot of people who go there today because they say that Dead Sea Salt the sea can actually help with all sorts of uh, medical issues and make you feel better and, and all these things so that people swear by it. Uh, so anyways, if you're ever in the area, definitely something to do. All right, let's move on. So last story, and this is the story of the Roman Emperor Hadrian. So we're jumping ahead a bit. You can see the years. Again, you don't need to memorize the years, just approximately. And the key person this time is a man named Simon Bar Kusiba. I've seen his name spelled many different ways because it's all translated from the Hebrew, of course. Um, and it is during the terrain of Hadrian that it's our last story, but also has the most profound long-term impact. So what's going to happen? So Hadrian was a pretty nasty Roman emperor. Uh, he was very powerful. He hated the Jewish people. Uh, he persecuted the Jewish people relentlessly. By now, the second temple had already been destroyed. That wasn't good enough for Hadrian. One of the other things Hadrian does is he goes into Judea and he outlaws circumcision. And he says, from now on, circumcision is prohibited in for the Jewish population in Judea. We talked about that before, I believe, in the other lecture, that circumcision for the Jewish people is one of the core characteristics of what it is. All male babies are circumcised. And Hadrian says, you can't do that. Well, obviously, the Jewish people in Judea, their temple had already been destroyed. They were already upset. And so this man named Simon Bar Kusiba leads a massive rebellion against the Romans. Hadrian uses that as an opportunity to sweep into Judea and massacre the rebellion. But not just the rebellion, countless number of Jewish people there. According to Roman sources, maybe as many as half a million. 500,000 Jewish people were slaughtered by Hadrian in Judea. So he outlaws circumcision. He's destroying the synagogues. He kills the population. But Hadrian did one other thing as well. One other important thing Hadrian did is he took this land of Judea and he renamed it. And what did he rename it to? Well, he renamed it to a term that is often used to describe that region today, Palestine. And when he takes that term Palestine, and he, I think, I'm hoping you're kind of understanding what he's doing. He's renaming the land. He's killing the population, outlawing the circumcision. Guys, this is your first genocide. You know, oftentimes people think of, of the Jewish people in World War II and Hitler. What is Hadrian trying to do? He's trying to destroy the Jewish identity, the Jewish people. Um, and that name of Palestine stuck for a very long time in that region. And there are people to this day now who refer to that region as Palestine, not realizing that it is a name that was used to, as, as part of the destruction of the Jewish people. Now, there is a whole other issue associated with that today because once we get to modern, modern, modern times, and we'll talk about this later in the semester, there will eventually be kind of a split of this land where you have a state of Israel and a state of Palestine. Um, it's what you refer to Palestine as. Is it the entire region of Judea? Is it only parts of the region of Judea? It gets to become a very complex and controversial term, actually, that we'll, we'll talk about at the very end of the semester. Uh, but to understand that fully, you almost have to be very patient uh, until the end of the semester. But it is important to know where that name comes from. Um, uh, and that is all part of what Hadrian was trying to do. Uh, so anyways, that's, that's all very important in terms of what Hadrian did. When he does that, what is the long-term impact of this? Well, remember, I said there were Jewish people living there. But once Hadrian is done with the Jewish people, the Jewish presence in Judea is minuscule. It is very small and will remain very small until about the 1800s AD. 
It will not be until about the 1800s AD until the Jewish people start to have an opportunity to move back into Judea because the Romans won't let them in there. Then you're going to have other powers moving into this region. Uh, and we'll talk about all these other civilizations that move in there. Uh, you know, it's going to be the various dynasties like the Abbasids, the Umayyad, the Ottomans, the British. Um, and it won't be until the 1800s till the Jewish people even have a chance to move back into Judea with great numbers, which in part creates the current conflicts in the Middle East, specifically in what is, again, modern day Israel slash the area of Palestine. Uh, because, yes, this is the first place for the Jewish people, but between the time the Jewish people were kicked out and between the time the Jewish people were able to move back in, other people moved into that region as well, which, of course, creates long term conflict. So anyways, those are the conflicts that are created. And I, I'm hoping you understand why I did spend several lectures on the antiquity period. Uh, and I said from the beginning, you can't understand the Middle East if you don't understand this today, if you don't understand all this stuff going back hundreds and hundreds and really thousands of years. This is one more thing I want to show you. This is kind of really illustrates, this is pretty dramatic. Um, it's a place called Bet Sheon that I was at many years ago. I've been there many times as well. It's an archaeological site in Israel. And I just got through saying a lot of other civilizations are going to move into Judea. And if you ever do make it to Israel, people go to Jerusalem, they go to Tel Aviv, they go to the Dead Sea, go to Bet Sheon. Because if you love history, you're like a little kid in a candy store here. Because what you're looking at, this images, these two images, represent about 20 different civilizations. On this piece of real estate that's not massive, maybe a size of a few football fields, you have about 20 different civilizations that at some point live there. And it's literally one civilization building on top of the other one. Um, and so if you give a couple close-ups here, you see uh, here you see some um, Roman columns that had fallen in an earthquake. This is an also Roman amphitheater. These are Byzantine mosaics that you see there. Uh, and then you could see images, uh, areas from uh, Egypt. You see things from uh, the Middle Ages, uh, just various powers that you could literally walk through and see kind of here's a good image of the Roman columns again. And all of this is in Bet Sheon. And so it's like you're just walking through all this history. And if you know what to look for, it's like, oh, that's Greek, that's Roman, that's Byzantine, that's from the Crusades, that's from this period, that's from that period. Uh, so it's just a cool little place to go and visit. So just kind of throwing out there. You don't need to know that for the quiz or anything, uh, but I always like mentioning that. But it does illustrate, again, the number of different civilizations that have lived in that piece of real estate after the Jewish people. All right, and that is the end of the antiquity. And so hopefully it was a pretty interesting set of lectures for you. I'm hoping you're enjoying the material up to this point. Uh, if you have any questions on any of that, please let me know. And then we're going to kind of move on to our next big theme, which is going to be, of course, the rise of Islam. Just like we spend a lot of time on the rise of Judaism, we're obviously going to spend a lot of time on the rise of Islam. Uh, but I also don't want you to start thinking, oh, man, this whole course is going to be about religion. No, not at all. You know, because once we get through, you know, the, the rise of the Islamic faith, then we're really going to get into a lot of the political dynasties um, and, and kings and, well, not kings, in this case, a lot of sultans. Uh, and it, it's a lot of different things. So we're just working our way through chronologically. Uh, and as always, if you have any questions about it, please let me know. All right. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day.